So as noted, the title of this talk is The Extraction of PFAS from Mixed Matrices Using a Rapid, Simple, and Automated Extraction System. So with that, let's get into it. What is PFAS? Well, PFAS are per- and polyfluoral alkyl substances. Um, the, one of the structures of one of them here, this is PFOS, one of the key ones of interest. It is perfluoral octane sulfonic acid. Um, and so this is, um, most of them have different carbon like chains, but they're fluorinated compounds. I'm not going to get too much into the chemistry in this particular talk, but just wanted to put a representation of the type of um, substances that we are talking about. Um, but the reason we're talking about this, and I am sure that um, anybody who goes out there and Googles um, PFAS can see that it is a hot topic in the news today. Um, it is certainly an emerging topic and will continue to grow as we realize um, the concerns associated with these substances. Um, they are man-made chemicals, and so we brought this kind of upon ourselves. Um, they have been used since the 1940s, so they've been used for a long time. And they're extremely um, persistent and they accumulate in our environment. Um, so this is really where the concern is. Um, you know, um, we're in the month of February here, and so we just got past Valentine's Day, and they say that diamonds are forever, but so are PFAS. Um, they are they stick around, and and when they stick around, they're also accumulating. Um, pretty much any one of us, we probably have PFAS in us um, as it's accumulating in our environment and in our systems themselves. Furthermore, um, remediation is difficult, so it's hard to clean up these substances. And they have been linked to adverse health effects. Um, I really think that we're going to see more and more um, adverse health effects linked to PFAS. Um, so this is a big problem. It's something we need to be looking at. And um, as I said, it's kind of emerging. We're starting to get methods in place um, as we learn more and more about this. Um, so beyond the fact that the chemicals themselves are scary, um, they are everywhere. Um, so pictured here um, is just kind of the, some of the places that we can find PFAS, but essentially um, it really is everywhere. The topic of PFAS has primarily been about drinking water to date. Um, that's where our methods do exist, um, and um, that's kind of the logical place to start is the drinking water. Um, but if it's in our water sources, it's getting into our soils, it's being consumed um, by um, into our produce, and that's eaten by our animals. It's getting into our food stuff. Um, and then furthermore, beyond that, um, it's in our cookware, the packaging that we're um, cooking our food in, the, the pizza boxes that we get pizza in, um, stain repellents, other consumer products. They truly are everywhere. So this is a really big concern um, because you can't really avoid them. Um, I am giving this talk from North Carolina, and just in our backyard, the Cape Fear River Basin is one of the big concerns right now. Um, so you really can't escape it, and it's something we need to take very seriously. So with that, let's talk a little bit about where regulation currently is, is at. Um, in the United States, we do not have any maximum containment levels um, for most of the PFAS. There is a health advisory out there um, for P PFOA and PFOS at 70 PPT, PPT um, but that's even starting to decrease. So these are detected at very, very um, low limits. Um, there are two EPA methods. We have EPA 533 and EPA 537.1. Um, both of those methods are for um, drinking water, um, and um, they both are similar processes in that you have your um, drinking water sample, you run it through um, uh, SPE cleanup, and then you analyze it on LC-MS-MS. Um, but drinking water is really where those methods lie. And what you'll note in this talk is I'm going to focus on sample sizes, samples outside the drinking water sector. So talk about some of those solid substances. I'm going to talk about soil and then get into food um, a little bit. Um, and as we continue this PFAS work, we're going to see um, more and more sample matrices becoming of interest. Um, but really, at this stage, we have to adapt um, all the methods kind of off of the EPA methods that we currently do have. The United States does have a PFAS action plan. Um, so we're working cross-agency, um, being very 
diligent. Um, so we are taking this very seriously. There's a lot of what current work um, being done. If we go outside the United States, um, in Europe, um, Denmark has become the first country to ban PFAS. And, and overall, the um, EU is working together to um, come up with regulation for PFAS. Um, and I make that point, we really do, across the board, need to work together. Um, because um, as this is an emerging topic and is something that is affecting us on a worldwide basis, um, the best case scenario would be to um, harmonize methods um, so that we're all doing this in the same manner. Um, Australia has been in the news a lot regarding PFAS, um, and they are working on a national phase out of PFAS. So really my point I want to make here is this is a global issue. Um, it is something that um, as far as you know, world people across the globe need to take seriously, and we need to come up with more and more methods and regulation for PFAS as we move forward. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm going to talk more about um, solid samples and particularly going to focus on soil to start with. So a typical um, extraction of PFAS um, for a soil sample would be what is pictured here. Um, so essentially you would weigh about one gram of your soil into a centrifuge tube. You would then add about eight mils of methanol um, that would then contain your surrogates at that point. You would shake for about 30 minutes, sonicate for 30 minutes, and then centrifuge for an additional five minutes. Then you typically do an SBE cleanup. Typically, it's some sort of um, graphite carbon black um, with an additional two mils, brings that final volume up to 10 milliliters. And then um, and you would add internal standards at this point as well and then you would bring it over and run the analysis. Um, so what you see is this is a very manual process. Um, there's a number of different steps involved, and um, it takes um, over an hour to get through um, all of these steps. So what I want to talk about as an alternative method is using the edge extraction system. Um, so the edge process is depicted here. Um, in this case, you would assemble your Q-cup that holds your sample. You would then weigh your sample, so that one gram, into the um, Q-cup. You would load that into the edge and run your method. Um, the method um, lasts for just under 10 minutes. At that point, you have your extract. It's ready to go. You're going to bring it to your known volume and then analyze it. Um, so if we look at the two processes together, um, what we see is the edge cuts out a lot of those manual steps. It it gives us automation. It's going to automate the actual extraction process. Um, and in doing that, you gain um, efficiency, right? You're removing the human aspect out of this. Um, so you get efficient. And then with efficiency, you get traceability, reporting options. There's all these other things you gain that are great for um, automation. So I'm a really um, visual person, and so I, you'll notice a lot of pictures throughout this talk because I think they really kind of p bring a message um, to life. And so with that, I want to watch a video of how the edge runs um, because you're kind of still probably like, well, what is that edge? Um, so in this video here, you'll see um, Brittany is going to come and grab a um, Q-disc. That enables our filtration, and then she's going to assemble the Q-cup. Um, the Q-cup is made up of aluminum, so you can put it directly on an analytical balance. It's really light and weigh your sample in. Um, you'll notice here that the racks that hold the samples are easily exchangeable, so you can be preparing samples while others are running. Um, the system is going to run 12 samples in series. Um, with just a few clicks, our methods are loaded. The automation is going to come down. It's going to pick up our Q-cup and it is going to load it into our chamber. Once the sample is in the chamber, the actuator is going to come down and create a sealed environment. Once you have that sealed environment, we're going to add solvent by both the bottom and the top. This is going to fully wet our sample. Once our solvent is added, we are then going to start pressurizing and heating. Um, as we pressurize, this creates a pressure differential, so that solvent on the outside is going to disperse up through the Q-cup, Q-disc into the sample, creating um, a dispersive effect which aids in the extraction process. Once we reach temperature and or hold time, it's going to drain through the Q-disc, 
through the cooling coil, so you're going to um, collect at room temperature, um, and then into your collection. We then add the option of a rinse, where you can take clean solvent, run it through, and collect that as well. So you see that collecting right here. At this stage, your extraction is complete. You can be taking that and running an analysis. However, we are running in series here. So we need to be cognitive of carryover, specifically for the PFAS conversation that we're having here today. So we need to make sure that we are completely clearing the system of any contamination. Um, on the edge, you can run multiple washes with multiple solvents. You can add heat, hold times. You really have a lot of flexibility to make sure no carryover is going to be there. And you see the system now going over to our waste port and washing that entire fluidic pathway that saw a sample. Um, so with that, the edge is complete, that entire process. Um, you saw it running real time, so it's very fast. Um, and then another really good feel-good thing about the edge is that your extracted sample, typically that's just waste. However, um, if you look at that, it is bone dry, and it was just in solvent. Um, that dry sample and that clear extract gives you that feel-good moment that you got a great extraction. So hopefully that gave you a nice introduction to what the EDGE um, does and how it functions. Now that's our generic video. I'd be giving that video for any application that I'm talking about. So let's talk a little bit more in detail of how, what other things we took in consideration for the particular application of PFAS. Um, so again, I want to note automation. That's really where it's at with the EDGE. We're automating what is typically a manual process. If you remember back to that um, flow chart um, for the um, standard method, they typically do an SBE cleanup. Um, so you can do that in cell on the edge. Um, so in the case of carbon graphite black, you could just add some of that to your Q cup and then your sample. So um, you can do that cleanup step during that automation process. Um, and then simple. I think that's a little bit overlooked sometimes, right? But I think in the modern world, simple is so key. Um, we are busy people, and we need to have simple processes because there's a lot going on in our world. And I hope what you see um, throughout this is that the edge is a very simple solution to a very complicated problem here. Um, and then that next bullet point, um, multi-matrix, multi-residue method, I kind of stole that from some of my other presentations. I, I give a lot of talks on pesticides um, where um, that is indeed true. But as I was putting this presentation together, the parallels between some of the pesticide stuff um, was very clear. Um, and even maybe more so, right? With, with pesticides, we have multi-matrix because we have a lot of different food stuff. Um, but with PFAS, it's beyond that, right? We're talking now water and air and soil and consumer products and food stuff. I mean, it, it is really just everything. Um, even biological samples get into toxicology. Um, so multi-matrix, I mean, it's kind of, you know, sky's the limit on the different things that we could be looking at here. Um, and then multi-residue, you know, there are over a thousand pesticides as well as PFAS. Um, we continue to identify more and more PFAS compounds. Um, so truly, um, when you have a method that can be applicable to a lot of different matrices for a lot of different residues, that is a big advantage. Um, and that is true for the edge for this PFAS um, problem that we have. Um, now that next bullet point, um, PFAS free, um, I'm going to dig in a little bit deeper here because this is so crucial for this particular application. Um, so I have been working um, in, in, you know, for an instrument company now for 13 years and, you know, worked with a lot of products and almost every single one of them has Teflon on it, right? As, you know, instrument manufacturers, we love Teflon. Um, it is robust and it holds up. It's inert. You can do high temperatures. It's all these great things that you want for instrumentation. However, we cannot have Teflon present when we're talking about PFAS because there's some PFAS components that could cause contamination there. So we need to eliminate any Teflon components on the system. So what we've done here is um, we've used PEAK and polypropylene tubing. Um, we're using PEAK for our stationary tubing and polypropylene for our movable tubing, so anything that's doing the automation. 
Beyond that, we have added a side enclosure. Um, the previous picture had of the edge had that side enclosure closed. In this picture, you see it open. Um, we just want to make sure that we have a completely clean environment so when the system's running, you can have that enclosure closed and making sure you're, you know, no dust or anything is um, getting into the system. Um, beyond that, um, if you saw in the video, we were collecting in glass files. Um, however, we can also collect in centrifuge tubes, and we're going to do that for this PFAS application. We also have a nitrogen option. So the standard edge does not need any gas sources. It simply runs with air. However, for the PFAS application, you may want to be running in an inert environment such as nitrogen, and that is an option that you can do um, that also just takes that extra step to making sure everything is clean and PFAS free. Um, so we've kind of discussed discussed about the components of the edge and make sure those aren't in introducing PFAS, but we also need to look at our consumables. And there's a fair number of consumables on the edge, right? You've got your Q-disc and your Q-cup and so forth. So we took that very seriously and um, did soak test and looked at data to make sure that nothing that our sample came in contact with had any PFAS contamination. So we tested our Q-disc, we tested the packaging of our Q-disc, we tested our Q-cup, um, the centrifuge tube that we're collecting in, the extraction solvent. Um, you're probably like, what is Q-matrix hydra? Um, I will get into that a little bit later on, um, but we did use it in one of our sample preps, um, so we needed to test it. So we tested our Q-matrix hydra and the container that the Q-matrix hydra comes in, the pipette tips that, tips that we used for um, spiking, that tubing, both the polyethylene and the um, peak that we used, and then we also tested an edge blank. Um, so and in, in anybody, anybody in this industry is going to take a lot of care to make sure that um, we are not introducing any PFAS into the system during the extraction. Um, so I want to take just one step further here because we talked about the instrument needs to be PFAS free. The consumables that touch the sample need to be PFAS free. But it the entire process, okay, from the sampling of sample to homogenizing to preparing the sample, that entire process through analysis needs to be PFAS free. So some of the pictures here are just some of the things we use during our sample preparation to make sure that we were not introducing PFAS into the um, situation. And I'll specifically go over our steps when I talk about the different samples. Um, but just quickly, kind of you see that mixer there, we have to think about not every homogenizer is going to be okay in this case, you have to make sure you're not introducing PFAS into the situation. So with that, let's talk about the samples that I'm going to talk about here today. So we're going to start with soil. Um, we're going to, you know, that's kind of that, kind of think that next wave of PFAS is going to be on those environmental samples. So we started with water and then we're probably going to see a lot of focus on um, soil and more and more of those types of samples. But I also think it's going to branch into food. So we're going to talk about a produce sample. Specifically, we'll talk about cucumber. And then we'll go over a few of, the, of some packaged um, food samples as well. So with that, let's talk about how we would prep these different samples. Um, on the edge, we're going to run the same method. However, we do need to be aware of how we prepare our samples with different um, with the different food stuff and so forth, the different types of samples that we're looking into. So what I'm going to do is talk through the slide from the bottom up. So um, if we start there on the bottom, we have to have our Q-disc. So the Q-disc that we are going to recommend for this application is our G1. That is a glass fiber Q-disc. Um, it filters down to 0.3 microns, so you can go direct to your um, LC analysis. Um, now, if anybody is familiar with just glass fiber as a material, um, it's not very strong, um, and we're running under a pressurized environment. So what we've done now is created this sandwich of that glass fiber filter with our C9 filters, which are our cellulose um, filters. And so that just creates a really robust um, Q-disc combination that you can apply to any sample type. Um, so same Q-disc, we're going to run for soil, cucumber, and our packaged food. 
Um, then um, we have to, in some cases, think about adding sorbent to remove any interferences that we might have. For the soil, we're not going to add anything at all. Okay, so the soil, we're just going to go directly into the cucumber. However, for that cucumber, um, it is a sample that contains a lot of water content, and that is where we're going to introduce our Q Matrix Hydra. Now, Q Matrix Hydra is a product that you can purchase directly from CEM. It is a polymer superabsorbent, and it does an amazing job at absorbing water. So, what we're going to do is put 2.5 grams of that Q Matrix Hydra at the bottom of the Q cup and then our cucumber sample. And it, that Q Matrix Hydra is going to absorb the water so we don't have water in our extract before we go to analysis. For our packaged food samples, um, those contain some lipid interferences. So, we're going to add 0.5 grams of C18 to remove those lipid um, interferences for those particular samples. So, soil, nothing. Cucumber, we use some Q matrix hydra. And for the packaged food, we're using a little bit of C18. Then, across the board, we're going to weigh in 5 grams of sample. So, 5 grams of soil, cucumber, and packaged food. And then we're going to spike. Um, in this case, we used absolute standards, PFOA, DOD. Um, it contained the 24 um, DOD compounds that they are looking for. Um, now, I do want to make a note here that for our study, we used absolute standards. However, I recognize that Wellington Laboratories is a very popular place to get PFAS standards. Um, and I think they have a very nice um, selection as well as um, some CRM as well. Um, so if you just have that question of what other PFAS standards are out there, I did want to make a note that Wellington Laboratories is a really um, good place to go as well. Um, so that's how you prepare your sample. So the, the, the differences of how we treat these samples occurs in the prep of that Q cup. Then we're going to move on and run that same at the same edge method for all of these samples. So I'm just going to talk about the edge method and we use the same method for any of the sample types I'm talking about here today. Um, I want to note that these screenshots for the method were taken directly from our software. So um, I hope you see just kind of that good user interface that we have, um, really simple, um, really amenable to making quick changes, and good for an R&D environment. Um, I'm going to talk about three different levels, the settings, the cycles, and then the wash. Um, on the settings um, shown here, um, pretty straightforward. We're going to name our project. We're going to pick our Q-Disk. And then for collection, we have combined there. All that means is that we're going to be running a two-cycle method, and we're going to collect both of those two cycles in one centrifuge tube. So our final sample is together in one collection. If we look at the actual cycle um, that we ran for this, um, please note that you probably can't read the solvent. So um, that is 80-20 methanol water with 0.3% ammonium hydroxide. And we used HPLC grade um, solvents for this um, study. Um, so we did do a two cycle method. And um, if you remember back in the video, I talked about a bottom add and a rinse. Um, but we're keeping this really basic and simple, and so we're actually going to just add for the top in these cases. So we're doing a 10 mil top add. We're going to heat to 65 degrees C. And we're going to hold for three minutes for the first cycle and four minutes for the second cycle. So if you note that, that's got a total hold time of seven minutes there, and then a little bit extra time for automation. In less than 10 minutes, your entire process is complete. Complete. I do want to cover the wash cycles, again, because carryover is something that we really need to be cognitive of, um, specifically for the PFAS conversation. Um, so in this case, we did um, two wash um, cycles. We did 10 mils of methanol, followed by 10 mils of the extraction solvent, and then we held that for just a few seconds at 50 degrees C. Um, and we've, um, obviously, with everything, we are collecting our blanks and running after and confirming that, indeed, no carryover is taking place. So this next um, slide, I really like to put out there because, again, I want to cover the details. Um, typically, if you, um, you know, I, I watch a lot of webinars and a lot of them deal with the analysis, which is really great work and, and, and things that we need, but often the sample preparation slide is, is either just one slide or maybe just not even mentioned at all. Um, however, the 
The sample preparation, these nitty gritty details that we're getting into here in this presentation are important. Um, you know, in the world of, of you know, extraction, if you, don't ha if you don't do the sample prep properly, you don't get good analysis. Um, so we need to be cognizant of how we're preparing our sample. Um, so I don't want to um, just gloss over the details. I want you to be able to go back and reproduce it and be able to understand each step we took along the road. Um, so for quantitation, you really do need to have a final volume. So we're going to dilute to a known volume to just be sure that we know that volume. And then also for this particular application, we neutralize with 20 microliters of formic acid. So at this stage, we are ready to then now do the analysis. And I will note that um, this was where we passed off the samples um, and outsourced the data. Um, so everything up to that last slide we did in our laboratory, and then um, we worked with Pace Analytical, um, formerly Shealy Environmental Sciences, located in Casey, South Carolina. And I have to give a huge shout out to Pace Analytical because they have been so helpful in this project. They had really good um, turnaround times for us. They were kind enough to share their logo and their HP PLC um, MS, MS method here. They, they, they shared their SOPs, so we understood how they would typically um, prep their samples. And so that was all very helpful. Um, so, you know, thank you to Pace Analytical um, in this. So, um, what they ran then the analysis on, analysis on is a SIX 4500 with an Agilent pump system. And the same um, considerations that we had to take for the edge as far as removing the Teflon com components and so forth that the analytical companies need to take um, into consideration as well. Um, so they're going to, um, in this case, they use stainless steel lines going into the mass spec and peak solvent lines and polyethylene tubing anywhere else. Um, so you see a lot of parallels there of the same things we had to do on the edge. Um, also, the, um, there was a sample chiller at 4 degrees C for the auto sampler. They used the Phenomenex column with the specifications listed there. Um, and then they had a guard filter and a delay column present. Um, the reality here is PFAS is there. Um, so you need these guard, um, the guard filter, the delay column to really filter out any contamination so that we're getting good analytical data. Um, did a 10 mil microliter injection volume. The um, mobile phase was 20 millimolar ammonium acetate in water and methanol, um, a flow rate of 1,200 microliters per minute, and a pretty standard gradient. Um, if you note, this gradient is just over eight minutes long. Um, so the extraction time was less than 10 minutes, and the analysis time was less than 10 minutes. So um, total process. You've got data in hand in under 20 minutes. That's really great for an R&D environment. Um, so um, just I like to make note of how rapid this process really can be. So this picture here, and again, you're going to see a lot of pictures as I talk through my samples. Um, and I usually do this in all my presentations, and sometimes I get a really pretty color story, and other times it's kind of okay. Um, so, um, but these are the actual extracts we ran, soil, cucumber, a snack cake, and a turnover, and we'll get into the details of all of those. Um, please note that for visual purposes, I transferred these extracts into the glass files because they look pretty there. Um, we did, for any analysis, we used um, centrifuge tubes. Um, but for pictorial purposes, um, extracts in the glass files just um, give a better picture. Um, and you can more clearly see the clear extracts and everything from there. So with that, let's talk about the soil sample first. Um, so again, here's a picture of the soil pre and post extraction and the actual um, extract that we had. Um, not too much going on here. Again, um, like I said, these samples aren't the most visually um, appealing as far as the changes that occur. Um, but again, I like to keep myself honest and show everything. Um, you see a little bit of clumping of the soil because we're draining through that, um, but it's perfectly dry and we've got a clear extract ready to go for analysis. I do want to note that for our so soil sample, we used clean sandy loam from Sigma Aldrich. And um, we did note a few PFAS in the background of the soil itself. Um, so we made um, a consideration of that for the data that I'm going to present here. 
So um, we wanted to do a pretty comprehensive study. Of, so we're going to talk about a low spike, a mid spike, and a high spike. Um, and we did three replicates across the board. And again, we spiked with that 24 compound um, standard um, for, again, so I want you to be able to see my numbers. Um, I'm splitting everything up into 12 and 12. Um, so we'll have two slides for um, each of these um, to cover all 24 compounds. For the low spike, we spiked at 0.1 ppb. Um, the limit of detection um, for this was 0.025 ppb, so just know that um, we're within the range of what we can detect here. And um, we got overall um, pace analytical requires an acceptable recovery range of 50 to 150 percent. So we wanted to make sure within that um, but um, overall, you see that we get good recoveries across the board and good RSD values for the um, 12 PFAS that you are looking at here. If we move on to the additional 12, we see the same story. Okay, so across the board for the 24, we got good recoveries and good RSD values for the low spike, which is the most challenging, um, really. Um, so we're very happy um, with this data. I do want to um, bring attention to a few specific um, PFAS compounds. Um, so PFOS and PFOA, um, those are the two that we have limits for um, right now and of two of the more um, big concern ones. Um, so I just wanted to you know, show that we've got good recoveries for those specific compounds. Um, but also the PFBA, I just want to bring attention to that because that is just a pesky one. It is the one that's difficult to get rid of. Um, so it's just as you work through the state and a no, um, you really have to pay a lot of attention to that particular one because it tends to show up um, everywhere. Um, so I just wanted to bring attention to that. If we move on to our mid-spike data, now this was spiked at 10 ppb. Um, if anything, you see an increase in recovery and tighter RSD values across the board. And pretty much we would kind of expect that as we increase our, our spike. Um, I do want to note that we are spiking here and spiking, we would expect to get good recovery values. If we move on to the next 12, we see the same story occurring and we get um, good recoveries across the board and good RSD values. Um, the next step in this study would be to run a CRM. Um, so we understand that. Um, we kind of, you know, following this process of doing these spike studies, and then we'd run a CRM to really bring home the fact that this method um, is working well. Um, so that would be the next step. If we move on to the high spike data, now this was now spiked at 20 ppb, um, you see the same trend of even higher recoveries and tighter RSD values um, for that high spike data. I do want to make a note that as you are increasing your spike value and you're getting hotter samples with these components, you need to be more and more aware of carryover. Um, so I really encourage people to make sure that they're looking at their, um, you know, blend bank runs and verifying that the wash parameters are indeed correct such that no carryover um, is occurring. Um, so that is just something that as you get to that high spike to be more and more aware of. If we look at the final 12 components here, we see across the board, again, good recoveries and good RSD values. Um, so this is going to conclude my talk on the soil. Um, but I hope you see that we've got a really strong set of data here um, showing that we can take that one edge method, apply it to the soil data, get an automated method um, that um, gives us really good recoveries for this PFAS compound. So let's talk a little bit now about a produce sample, and particularly they are going to talk about cucumber. Um, now I want to note that moving forward, um, we're not going to do any more spiking. We're just going to run the sample and show if any PFAS are present. This is all really preliminary work. Um, there's more work to be done here. Um, I don't know if there's really any methods out there to refer to with like a wet food sample at this stage. So this is really kind of at the um, beginning stages of the study and moving on to these more challenging sample matrices. Um, so this is definitely pre preliminary work and we have you know, more work to do um, with spiking these compounds and, and so forth. Um, but anyways, with the cucumber sample, um, we cut it up with a methanol cleaned knife and then we homogenized it in that stainless steel mixer. 
Um, and then if we look at the actual, um, you know, more marketing stylized photos here, um, what you'll see is that, um, again, kind of same story, not too much transformation occurring here. That white substance um, for the post extract is that Q matrix hydra that was absorbing the water. And then we get a nice um, clear extract ready to go for analysis. Um, and then if we look at the data, um, you know, we picked up some PFAS. Um, and, you know, I don't know how surprising this is. Um, I guess we would hope that there would not be too much PFAS going on in our produce itself, um, but we did pick up a few. I do want to note that um, I'm not talking about quantification at anything here, okay? I'm not talking about these were over any sort of limits. Um, all that these were were above the detection limit, so we saw that they were present, okay? And we certainly did run blanks beforehand and blanks after to prove that indeed this is coming from the sample. Um, I do want to note that uh, PFOA, one of those ones of concern, is one of the ones that we detected in this particular sample. Um, so now I want to move on to a snack cake sample. Um, so the pictures here are real world pictures. These were just snapped, you can kind of tell, in lab as we were prepping the samples, keeping us honest of just the process and what was going on. Um, so how we prepared the snack cake is we removed the icing and then chopped up the cake. Now, why did we look at just the cake? Well, we're looking really, what we wanted to look at is the part of the food that was touching the packaging because um, we're thinking that primarily the PFAS contamination could possibly be coming from the packaging itself. And so we want to focus on the food that was in contact with that packaging. Um, we then we dried the chop cake for 1.4 five hours in the oven at 100 degrees C, and then we ground it with a pesto mortal, which led to that final sample you see there, and then the extract um, that you see. If we look at the more stylized photo, you see that same, same process of the fact that not really any transformation. The white that you see going on here now in the post extract is that little bit of C18 that we put in there to remove the lipid compound. And then um, we get that um, clear extract ready to go for analysis. And then not surprisingly, um, we saw more PFAS in the snack cake um, than we did in the cucumber. Um, and, and, you know, again, I'm kind of happy. I, if we had more in the cucumber, I'd probably be even more scared. Um, but that snack cake, you see it pictured there. That's what we ran. Um, and then I have that PFOA highlighted because that was part of the ones that we did detect in this particular sample. Now let's move on to the microwavable turnover sample. Um, so, um, you know, from the beginning, you're probably like, turnover, what, what, what is she talking about? Maybe now you have a little bit of a picture of what I'm talking about. You know, it's those turnovers that you put in that um, sleeve that you then drop in the microwave and heat up and if I'm reading the packaging, enjoy. Um, and um, so, again, the way we prepped this is we prepared the microwave turnover as instructed. So we, we, we heated it up, we, we did it as the microwave, and then we removed the outer bread. Again, we were looking for the sample that was in contact with the packaging. And then we um, dried that outer bread in the oven for 1.5 hours at 100 degrees C, and we ground that with a mortar and pestle. Um, and then you see the actual um, sample we had there, and then the extract that we got for analysis. And the same story here with these pictures, you see that kind of, if anything, the sample starts to clump up a little bit, but it's still perfectly dry. That has that white powder of the C18 present that we added to remove the lipids, and then a clear extract that we took for analysis. Um, so then if we look at the data here, um, maybe not surprisingly, even more PFAS. So a lot of hot ones um, for this particular um, sample. So I don't know how much, you know, as I um, prepared for this talk, um, you know, I stopped using my Teflon coated pans. <laughs> I've really thought about some of the food stuff. You know, I guess I was just kind of um, naive to how many different components are out there that really are exposing us to these compounds. Um, in this case, we pick up both um, PFOS and PFOA, um, so those two ones that we're um, paying particular attention to. Um, so overall, again, I, I want to note, this is a beginning study. Um, we're working with some challenging substances here, right? You know, once we get into these food stuff with all these different components, um, 
extraction becomes harder. Um, and so what I hope you see is that we were able to extract these compounds um, at the um, beginning level. But clearly, we need to show um, moving forward spike values. We get good um, recoveries and RSD values. Um, but I feel that you know the edge is going to be very applicable to all of these samples and, and beyond. Um, so with that, I want to kind of conclude. Um, so I hope you've seen throughout my talk today that edge um, instrumentation is PFAS free um, and that there's no contamination from the sample preparation or the consumables. Um, and then for that soil sample, we got good recoveries and RSD values for the low, mid, and high spike um, that we found PFAS in cucumber, snack cake, and turnover. Um, and that overall, the EDGE is a rapid, simple, and efficient technology for the extraction of PFAS from mixed matrices. Um, and I want to just expand upon that just a little bit right now, right? Because um, kind of to go back to the beginning of the talk and saying how the current talk primarily is water. Right, that's where our EPA methods are for drinking water, and it's where most of the work has been done to date is on water samples. And I don't want to completely exclude water as a possibility to run on the edge. Now, the EPA methods are for 250 milliliters of water. Now, 250 milliliters is outside the scope of what we could run on the edge. However, if we considered maybe um, concentrating that sample size down and running some sort of supported liquid extraction um, and or running a smaller sample size, we could indeed be able to run those liquid samples, those water samples, on the edge. Um, and then as we open up that realm of liquid samples, we could do dairy, you know, milk is a very hot topic right now. Um, so I hope that you see for mixed matrices, it's not limited to what I've discussed here. Um, we can do water and soil and even get into air monitoring, um, the food stuff that we're talking about, the packaging, you know, that was our next step too, is to actually look at the packaging itself and what components are all of that. All of those matrices you can run on the edge. Um, so with that, um, if any of you guys have ever heard any of my webinars before, you know that I like repetition. Um, I have a five-year-old daughter, and I think as I um, went into parenthood, it hit me how much repetition truly does help us in the learning process. You know, I am amazed at how many times, you know, my daughter can watch the same episode on something. However, she's, you know, really getting a lot of information, and she's learning during that process. So I like to repeat. Um, so I'm going to kind of bring this full circle. It was the title of the talk. I covered it in the um, um, conclu conclusion side. And now I'm going to say it again. Rapid, simple, and efficient extraction of PFAS from mixed matrices. If you take anything away from it, just the simple title is what I want you to remember because that's what the truth is. The EDGE offers a rapid, simple, and efficient extraction for PFAS from a variety of different matrices. Thank you for um, listening to me here today.